When you think of ancient civilizations, what comes to mind? The pharaohs of ancient Egypt building the pyramids almost 5,000 years ago? Or maybe the cradle of civilization in the Middle East dating back about 10,000 years ago? But what if I told you that there was an ancient culture of people whose history dates back further than any other culture on Earth? And that that culture still exists today. I'm talking about Indigenous Australians, also known as Aboriginals or First Nations people. It's estimated that this culture's origins date back further than 60,000 years, which means they've been around since the world looked like this. And if you think Australian animals today are dangerous, it's been confirmed that ancient Indigenous Australians lived alongside megafauna like this, that are now long extinct. Indigenous Australians have never had any form of written language, yet they have their own version of recorded history, passed down for generations over tens of thousands of years, in the forms of stories, art, songs, and dance. Some of these stories to outsiders might just sound like fairy tales, but they have later been confirmed by science to be factual events passed down through generations for centuries. These are just a few of the mind-blowing facts from over 60,000 years of rich ancient history that is abundant in this culture. But what has now become one of the most crucial parts of their history is that over the course of 250 years, it was almost entirely erased. This is the story of the First Nations people of Australia. For the past few weeks, we've been traveling around Australia seeking adventures. And one of the most important parts about exploring a new country is getting to know the culture that makes it unique from other countries. However, for this episode, it won't just be our international team that will be learning more about the culture. I was born and raised in Melbourne, and apart from the three years that I lived in LA, I've hardly been anywhere outside of my home city. And as it turns out, Australia is a pretty big place. So to say that there's a lot I still have to learn about the country would be an understatement. Like many British colonized countries, Australia has a complicated relationship with our indigenous people. And as a white man educated through the Australian public school system, I only recently began to realize just how little I know about the indigenous culture. So this episode would give me the opportunity to learn more. We have gone on a bit of a road trip today, driven about four hours out to join the Budge Bim Indigenous Cultural Tour. We're going to be walking around on country, learning about the indigenous people that used to live on these lands thousands of years ago, so there'll be a lot to take in. Meeting, which is welcome, brothers and sisters, to Gundij Mara, Karap Gundij, and Gilga Gundij country. Australia, being a similar geographic size to the United States, is home to hundreds of different indigenous groups, each with their own distinct culture and traditions. In fact, there are over 700 different languages and dialects from around the country. That's one of the things that, that, that's important about Aboriginal culture. Our history has always been passed down orally. Storytelling seems to trump everything. If you can go out and tell a story, you know, you can live forever. Unfortunately, Indigenous Australians have experienced significant marginalisation and discrimination throughout much of Australia's history. In fact, it wasn't until 1967 that Indigenous Australians were even legally counted as part of the population. However, one of the most egregious acts perpetrated against Indigenous Australians is what is now referred to as the Stolen Generation. The term Stolen Generation refers to a dark chapter in Australian history which took place between the late 1800s and the 1970s. During this time, tens of thousands of Indigenous children around the country were forcibly removed from their families by the Australian government and placed into institutions like church missions or with white families. That's, that's where the mission, was, the mission church was, just over here. Let's oh, where over the cross it. is here? Yeah, just to the left of it a little bit. For those who don't know, and what happened for those decades with missions popping up around the country and what the government was trying to do with Aboriginal children, basically, is that something that happened here as well? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a breeding ground for a lot of that um, trauma from the stolen generation, from, you know, the forced labour. Um, uh, people were working to provide and, uh, for their families, but they, they never got paid whilst they lived on the mission. The work that they did was only paid in rations, and that was flour, sugar, tea. Um, and so understanding that, that the work that they would do inside this gate here, 
It was not for themselves, it was not for each other, it was for the church. At these church missions, these stolen indigenous children were forced to speak only English and had to believe in Christianity. They were not allowed to speak their native language or about where they came from. This was in an attempt to make them forget everything about indigenous culture, so that it would eventually cease to exist. When you came through that gate, when you came onto the mission, you know, you were punished if you were caught you know, teaching culture, speaking about culture, you'd be punished and your punishment was severe. It was, you know, you weren't fed, your children were taken off you, you know, you were moved off to another mission. And so you didn't want that sort of punishment. Most of these indigenous children were stolen so young that they had no idea where they came from. And they were severed from their true families for the rest of their lives. This is what we call the children's dawn. Um, you, if you were to you know, disobey the rules of the mission manager, your children would be taken off you and placed in the children's dorm. A black car would come down that driveway, pick them up, take them to Ballarat, and they would, you'd, probably ne you'd never see them for another you know, 18 years. My dad turned 60 last year. Um, so my dad was taken as a young kid um, and, and yeah, part of the Stolen the generation. Food draw attention to the fact that we're talking one generation yeah, ago yeah. that this was at the latest that this was happening yeah it's not some ancient history no no yeah so your, your dad my was... dad was part of the stolen generation too and yeah he was one of the first tour guides so right. for him to come back and do that after being stolen from his culture at such a young age you know that it speaks volumes to the person that he want, wanted to be mm -hmm. and, and that he was able to become going forward what do you want the message from this video to be and, and in terms of what, what we can continue to do, yeah, all of us, to move forward. If, if, if you're trying, um, you know, that's one step. Mm. If you're not trying at all, you're sort of behind the eight ball. Yeah, you gotta um, seek it out yourself. Seek it out. So, seek it out is exactly what we intended to do. Because me, Tommy and Des were about to travel to the other side of the country to immerse ourselves in a remote indigenous community called Jadanjin. Nothing like a 7 a.m. flight. <laughs> Yay. We have officially arrived, Western Australia. G'day, Western Australia. <laughs> G'day, mate. It is hot. You ready to drive? Yeah, man. That rental car guy didn't instill me with a lot of confidence. He's like, you know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Jerenjin, here we come. Let's do it. The road trip starts now. We are out there right now. I've never been anywhere like this kind of terrain before in Australia. Let's leave him. Yeah, I'll do a little prank. Let's do it. Hurry, hurry, lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> You're abandoned in the desert. <laughs> you drove really far. Hey, pal, you looking for a ride? I've been out here for three days. <laughs> hey, hop on in. We'll do anything. <laughs> we wanted to take a quick break from the video to thank everyone who has supported Seek Discomfort. Every time you purchase something from Seek Discomfort, it is directly funding these stories and enables us to support communities along the way. Seek Discomfort has always been a vehicle and a reminder for others to always chase the discomforts in life. If any of this resonates with you and you would like to support the message to help us tell more stories like this, head to the link in the description. We have just added new items to our essentials collection, including our other mantras, Yes and Love Over Fear, and we added new colorways. So check it out while stocks last. And for the EU viewers out there, a reminder to use the EU website for faster shipping and no custom fees. Once again, thank you to all who have watched our videos and bought from Seek Discomfort. Now let's get back to the adventure. We've driven right into a uh, middle of a rainstorm. <laughs> That is fucking heavy. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I guess we're here. Even though it's, it still seems like we're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, we literally haven't seen anything for like two hours. Yeah. Jadanjin is a small Aboriginal community located on the northwestern coast of Australia. It's home to the Bardi people, who have lived in the area for thousands of years. I got my driver's license for. The community has a population of about 400 people, and they have a rich culture of traditional practices, including hunting, fishing, and gathering bush tucker. We were invited to Jadanjin by Vincent, who would be our guide during our visit. This is our vitamin C. Thank you. Chop them? Yeah. We make medicine out of it. Good. Yep. Here we would spend the next few days understanding more about how an indigenous community currently lives and some of their ancient cultural practices that they still right. use today.
Tell me which one do you want? I'll give you. Cook it. Me? Yep. Oh dear. Sam's first crab. Boy becomes a man. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa. One shot's all we needed. Wow, I've never seen one that big before, honestly. Yeah. I'm on the hunt for some clams, I think. I don't even know what they are. Nice. Being out here is so weird, like in this mud and terrain, it's just so unusual. I don't see anything like this. It kind of feels like you're on another planet. It's like an Easter egg hunt. Nice. It's bloody hot work out here. Sweating tears. Yeah, take a rest. Oh, yes. Ooh. Oh my gosh. I found three and you found that many. <laughs> Look at you. That's seven. Yay. Be the end of a hard working day. I get why they're all full of life. Five meter croc, top water croc, swimming along. Kidding. Right here? Yep. Oh. Right where we're swimming. <laughs> Interesting. From just these past few weeks of exploring indigenous culture, I can't help but feel like I'm only scraping the surface of what is a deep well of information. And yet, I've also learned more than I had my entire life before making this episode. While I myself and all non-indigenous Australians have a long way to come in terms of educating, understanding and repairing relations with our indigenous people, I am reminded of something Braden said to me. The most important part I think is to acknowledge you guys and the journey you might have travelled through country to get here. I think it's really important to take that step of learning about something new, coming on this tour and having these conversations today do that really well. Before we can do anything else, we first have to listen. Giving Indigenous people a 